All right, y'all. So we are going to be talking about levels of organization. So remember, biology is the study of living things, right? And uh, one of the things that you have to know is basically about all of the, the living things that uh, happen here on Earth, and then just kind of a little bit about the non-living things. But um, you'll see what I mean in a little bit. But these are called the levels of organization. And uh, you'll see what you mean by that. It's basically like you see in this picture here, the individual, like you see down at the bottom, the moose, and then the population, which is a group of moose and a community. And so we'll, we'll talk about that all in, de in a little bit of detail. But that's what we're going to start off with here is the levels of organization within an ecosystem. And we'll all explain all of this um, yeah, in the next few slides. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So the thing uh, that I mentioned is uh, when we're learning about living things, you also kind of know a little you need to know a little bit about the non-living things, right? So uh, right here, they're kind of broken up into two groups. Whenever you see the word bio, y'all, the word bio means life, right? So whenever something, uh, whenever you see that, it's it's safe to say that it has to do with something that is living. Um, so right here, you see a biotic factor in this first group. All living things that live together in an environment in an environment are biotic factors, right? So again, living things. You see here at the bottom, there's a bird and some grass. And then in the pictures right there, you see a, a longhorn, uh, cattle. And then I think in the middle there, it's kind of small, but that looks like fungus, like mushrooms and things like that. And then above that, you see uh, what looks like grass or maybe moss. But again, those are all living things, right? Those are biotic factors. And then in this next uh, piece right here, the second half of the screen, you see it says abiotic factors, right? So abiotic means all non-living factors, such as water, soil, light, and temperature. So again, uh, those are not living. So abiotic means non-living, and then biotic just means living, right? But they got to live together. Uh, they, they've evolved. Um, they, they've worked together, right? Living things and non-living things have lived on this earth for um, what is it, hundreds of millions of years, right? And so... Um, yeah, this is, this is a big difference between biotic and abiotic factors. And so list the biotic parts and the abiotic parts in the picture below. All right, so let's talk about the six levels of environmental organization, right? So basically this is just saying that this is how the, the biosphere, which is all living things on the planet are organized, right? So at the smallest point, the, the smallest level right here, you have, uh, this crocodile, right? So these crocodiles right here, an organism is just one thing, right? So there's just one crocodile right there. And so that's an organism, right? You are an organism. You're just one living thing. Uh, a, a single little piece of bacteria is a living thing. A flower is an organism, um, a plant, uh, any kind of plant, and anything that is alive and is by itself is an organism, right? So this right here, the crocodile is uh, the smallest level. There's only one uh, crocodile here, and that's an organism. Above that, you have the population, right? So the population, you see that there is more than one crocodile right here, right? There are a few of them. And so that's what a population is, is a group of the same species. And when I say the word species, and let me just kind of write it out right here. Whenever you see the word species, that means that they are of the same uh, type of animal or living thing and that they can have a baby together and they can mate and have a baby and then that baby can have a baby. Right. And sometimes two animals can mate and have a baby, but then that baby cannot have a baby like a horse and a donkey. If they get together and they make a baby, that's a mule. But a mule cannot have a baby. A mule it is sterile, so it cannot have babies. Right. So species, again, these crocodiles are all the same species. And let me put it right here so you can see what I'm talking about. These guys right here, they're all the same species. Right. And so that's what a population is. They're all the same species living in one area. When you're talking about like the population of Austin, you're talking about all of the humans living in one area. Right. If you're talking about um, the ants uh, in that live in your yard, those are the ants that live in your yard. That is a population of ants. Right. So that's what a species is. A community right here is different species of living things uh, living together right in the same area. And so right here you see you have some birds. And then you have like, it looks like a crab, uh, where is it? The crab right here. Looks like you have some birds right here. And then over here you have some crocodiles. And then over here you have, and then get a different color, you have some grass right here, some trees. So all of these are living things, right? And living in one different species living together, right? And so these right here are all examples of a community. All right, but let's look right here. This is an ecosystem. So the ecosystem right here, an ecosystem is a bunch of uh, living uh, things together, a bunch of uh, communities of living things together, but then it's also got abiotic factors. Remember when we talked about that uh, word right there? 
abiotic. Abiotic, remember, means non-living things, right? So here, water, water is not alive. So water would be part of that abiotic. If you have dirt, if you have rocks, uh, the environment, all of the things that are not living, those are the abiotic factors. So remember, ecosystem is the abiotic and uh, biotic factors living together in an area. And we'll see it more right now in more detail. And then a biome, y'all, is just, uh, you can see right here, a biome is just a larger piece of, of area. Um, and some biomes include like deserts and rainforests and tundra and things like that. All right. And then up here, you see the biosphere and you see the picture over here of the, the earth. Right. So earth, y'all, whenever you see the word right here, bio, remember bio means living. Right. And then when you see the word sphere, sphere just means like a ball, right? Shaped like a ball. So biosphere is just basically all the living things on earth. Right, so let's see that just in a little bit more detail, y'all. And I will repeat myself quite a bit, but that's that's intentional, right? That's the point of learning is you got to repeat something over and over and over until you start to understand it, right? And then when you know the concepts, then you can connect big pictures together. But here the organism, just an individual animal, plant, or single cell life form, right? Like I said, any living thing that is on its own. The population, a group of organisms of the same species that live together. So earlier we saw the crocodiles, right? But here you see zebras. This is a population of zebras living in this area, right? So in the same, and again, species means that they can have uh, babies with each other and then those babies can have babies, right? And so there are some things like a, a zonkey. I don't know if you all have ever heard of a zonkey before, but a zonkey is a mix between a zebra and a donkey. And a zebra and a donkey can have a baby, but then that baby cannot have any babies, right? It is sterile. And so, um, you know, that's what, again, a species means. So what is a population? In biology, a population, again, just a group of organisms of the same species. So here the example that you see are wolves, right? Uh, how large a population is and how fast it is growing are often used as a measure of its health. So, you know, those population numbers are growing quickly and, uh, they're growing and then they're growing quickly, then that is a good sign of, of, of that population. Sometimes that can be a bad thing for the other populations, right? Like if uh, like deer in an area, wolves are good because they control the deer population. But if all of a sudden you get rid of wolves and the deer number, it just, you get more and more deer, more and more deer, and they just start eating all the plants and all the, every, all the food basically that other plants, other populations can eat, then those other populations are going to get hurt. Right. So even if it's good for one population, that doesn't mean it's good for all the other populations. So here's some population examples. All, right. all of the gray wolves that live in Yellowstone National Park. Again, we're just talking about wolves, groups of wolves, but in one area. Right. The National Park. All of the grackles that live in Austin. So grackles are a type of bird. Right. And these birds are we're just counting the ones that live in Austin. That is an example of population. All of the fire ants that, that live in Mr. Stanley's yard. So all of those fire ants, they are all one type of organism and they all live in one area, right? Mr. Stanley's yard. So that is an example of a population. And again, like I said, cities, when you go into a city, you will see that when it has a population on the sign, like going into a city, it's talking about the humans in that area, right? So th that again is population. All right, so now you go ahead and try it. All of the blank that live in blank, right? This is, would be an example of a population. And so the limiting factor, uh, limits to population growth, right? We have these limiting factors. Again, um, it can be something like uh, food, right? If all of the deer in one area, they grow so large that all of the food is eaten, then that limiting factor is the food, right? If there's so many animals in one area that they drink all the water and there's no more water for the animals, then that limiting factor was the water. Right. Sometimes in humans, like what happens in China is that there's so many males there, not enough females there, that eventually the limiting factor will probably probably be females because there's not going to be enough females for males and females to mate and have babies. Right. So carrying capacity is uh, it kind of goes with that. Right. The carrying capacity is just the max population that can live in an area. So it means like, let's say the number is 200. 200 is a carrying capacity. That means if you have more than 200 organisms in that population, then um, if you go past that, then all of a sudden there's not going to be enough uh, food or water or whatever it is. And then that population is going to go down. So the numbers are going to go from 200 uh, to 100 to 50 to zero, right? If, if everyone dies. And so there are two major types of limiting factors, density dependent factors and density independent factors. So let's look at those right now. 
So density dependent factors, right? They depend on the density of a population. So the more dense, the stronger the effect is of, of that density dependent, right? So disease, food availability, water, mating opportunities, shelter, uh, all of these right here, you see that the more dense something is, the more, the stronger the effect of that is gonna be. And then predation, just meaning predators, right? Things that eat all of the other organisms like wolves, right? Are predators to deer. And so density independent factors. So again, y'all think about the, the, this, right? The more something is, the more people, the more living things you have in an area, the more it's gonna be affected by this, right? So food availability. If you have a lot of people, there's gonna be less food. If you have a lot of people, there's gonna be more disease. If you have a lot of people, there's gonna be less water. Like I said, with China, they were, um, you know, they would value males being born and not females. And so now they have too many males and not enough females. And now uh, there's news articles about China's population population collapsing, right? We'll see if, if that happens. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that's what they say in the news, right? Then shelter, if there's so many people, um, then they took all the shelter, there's no more shelter. And then the same thing, right? If there's too many predators, they're going to eat all the prey. And then the populations are going to be, uh, one is going to be real big and one of them is going to be really small. So again, it just means the more dense the, the population is, the more living things there, the more these are affected, uh, the more those living things are affected by these things. Right, then you have density independent factors. So independent of density of population, it doesn't matter how big the population is, um, these things are, are gonna happen. And I don't know, now with humans though, it's kind of different because we've kind of messed up the whole earth. So we've kind of affected a lot of these things, but usually it doesn't matter how big a population is. Like if you have a lot of deer in the forest, that's not really gonna prevent a forest fire. It's not gonna cause a forest fire. So again, uh, the a forest fire is, not, it is independent of uh, how many deer you have. Same thing with hurricanes, right? Hurricanes, um, it doesn't matter how many people you have living in these areas, you're, you're still gonna get a hurricane, right? It is independent of how many living things you have in those areas. Again, with climate change, we've probably messed this up, but you know, uh, the next one you see the drought right there, right? All of the dry ground, that drought is not, it doesn't depend on how many people or living things you have in an area, not usually, right? If they go and they drink all the water, then yes, but usually it's just because there's no rain in those areas. And then pollution right here. Well, this one, we did uh, cause this, right? We do cause this right here. And so uh, the winter you see right there, the ice on the plant, we, uh, it doesn't usually depend on the population, whether winter or how cold it gets or things like that, right? So again, if it's independent, it does not matter the size of the population. All right, then let's move on to community. A community is a group of different organisms living in the same place, right? So you can see right here, there's elephant and zebra, and it looks like gazelles maybe, I think is what those are called. And then there might be like some uh, frogs in the water, things like that. And so groups are different organisms living in the same place. You also see trees and bushes and things like that. So again, groups of organisms living in the same place. You can also think of Austin as a community, right? We have humans and cats and dogs and bugs and uh, all kinds of different things, trees, grass, all living in one area. Communities are made up of populations of different species. The biotic part of an ecosystem, remember y'all, biotic just means living thing, right? That is, these are talking about the living parts of an ecosystem. And all the populations, all the, of the species in the same area, right? So here you see there's like a bird, there's a couple birds, there's a, a raccoon, a wolf, not a very good picture, but you know, you can kind of see those things here. And also includes their interactions, right? How the wolves and the raccoons and, and the, the plants and all of that, they interact together. And so here is this example right here. Um, this table shows some observations made by four students during a field trip to a nature area. Then it says at the bottom, which student made observations of a community of organisms, right? So for this one, you would have to find, um, again, what it is that uh, has living things living in the same area, but not just one kind of living thing, right? Different uh, species of organisms. All right. <clears throat> All right, now let's talk about ecosystem in a little more detail. So an ecosystem is made up of a community of organisms and the abiotic environment of the community. So remember y'all, what we saw just a little while ago is a community, right? These are all the living things in one area, uh, different species living in one area, right? So all the living things, all the biotic parts. 
when you get here to the ecosystem, you'll see that now they added the word right here and they underlined it. I'll just kind of highlight it for you all right here. But they also put the word abiotic, right? So in an ecosystem, it is made up of a community of organisms. So you have the living things right here and I'll kind of put that in green, right? Organisms are the living things. And then the abiotic is the non-living, right? So it's all together, uh, community, the biotic and abiotic are living together. An ecologist studying the ecosystem could examine how organisms interact as well as how temperature, precipitation and soil affects the organisms, right? So right here, uh, what he's talking about or what they're talking about right here, the temperature is abiotic, precipitation is abiotic and soil is abiotic, right? So those are all the, the non-living things. And then here they're living with the uh, organisms. So living and non-living things, right? And here you see an example of an ecosystem. You see this dead uh, log right here on the ground. Uh, that is abiotic. The water is abiotic, but inside the water and even on the logs, you have uh, living things, right? Those turtles, a fish, um, Looks like you have little plants living in the water. And then up here you have the deer and you have this eagle. And so all of these things uh, are the ecosystem, right? Biotic and abiotic together. All right, and so ecosystems can vary in size. A lake could be considered an ecosystem. So could a dead log on a forest floor. Both contain a variety of species that interact with each other and with abiotic factors, right? So I don't know if you've ever, um, been uh, to a lake, but you got all kinds of things in the lake, right? There's stuff living inside the water, maybe even on the water, and there's stuff on the beaches and in the, the woods right there by the water. All of those things are considered in ecosystems. You have living and non-living things. Same thing with this dead log right here. I don't know if y'all have ever had like a rock or a log or something, and then you flip it over like in your yard, and then all of a sudden there's all these insects and all kinds of little things underneath there. And even uh, the log itself, right? That's That's all an ecosystem. So ecosystems, like it says, it can be large or it can be small. But remember, it's living and non-living things interacting together, like in a certain area. And so this, this uh, question right here, the diagram shows some of the levels of biological organization. So here you see, um, you know, the first picture is showing you one thing right here. And then this one is showing you something else. And then this one is showing you, so, you know, it's kind of pointing out a few different things here. Um, and I guess let me erase this because it should have highlighted it like that, right? You see this, a group of organisms. And then here you see, it's not just the, the buffalo anymore, right? You do have the buffalo, but now you have a bunch of little random things right here. These look like gophers, maybe. This looks like a snake right here. Um, and then up here, you have a, a eagle, it looks like flying. And so, you know, you're seeing three, two, three different types of levels of organization. So in what order do you see them here in this in these pictures or in this diagram? All right, so ecosystem components. You have habitats, y'all. A habitat is just a place where, where something lives, right? And so uh, even here in Austin, we have a place called Habitats for Humanity. What their job is to do is basically build houses for people that can't, uh, they don't have enough resources to build them themselves, right? So habitat is just kind of a place to live. Whenever, every, whenever you see that next word right there, this one right here, uh, some people pronounce it niche, some people niche, uh, you know, it, it all depends on, on how you like to pronounce it. But this basically means it's a little place, um, you fit like a little place in the environment, right? So for me, like if you're, I was talking about being a, a teacher here at the Excel Center, my niche is, um, is science, right? And so for me, that's a little space that I take up in this ecosystem of the Excel Center, right? If you're talking about um, like birds, you see right here in the, this picture, um, this bird right here on the right, they're, they look like woodpeckers and their niche is just living like on that part of the tree right there. They don't live on the ground part of the tree and they don't live like on the highest, very top part of the tree. They live somewhere in the middle, right? So that is their niche right there. And niche isn't just like where they are located. It's also what time of the day do they eat, right? What time of the day do they mate? Because some, some birds niche is like uh, eating during the day. And some of them uh, are nocturnal, which means that they are active at night. Right. So that's also part of the niche right here. And that kind of works for me, too, because I'm a day teacher. Right. We also have night teachers here. And so that would be their niche. Right. There's a nighttime science teacher. That's their niche. Mine is actually science, but also pretty much anything else they ask me to teach. Right. That's my niche. Um, competitive exclusion exclusion principle. Oh, and the picture right there to the left. It looks like there's a big clam and then a bunch of little clams uh, shell. They're like a little shellfish that are stuck on that. Right. And that's where they live. That's their niche. That's that's their place in the ecosystem. And so 
competitive exclusion principle, y'all, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting principle. It's just saying that if one, if there's two animals or two uh, organisms, or you can even say two species, right? And they're trying to live in the same niche. It's, it's not going to work out well for one of them, especially if one of them just gets one little bit of an advantage. Like uh, the species has like a better way to eat food at, at the daytime. And the other one isn't that good at eating food during the daytime. Maybe their their vision, their eyesight is not very good. And so the one that has better eyesight and can eat better during the day, then that one is going to have a big advantage over the one that cannot. And then eventually the one that can eat uh, better during the day is going to have a bigger, healthier population. And the one that cannot is not going to have a very big population. Because like it says right here, competitive exclusion, it means they're competing for food or they're competing for habitats or they're competing for mates. Right. And if one of them has an advantage over the other, then the other one is their population is going to go down and the one that has the advantage is going to go up. Right. So that's what the competitive exclusion principle means right here. Right. Is that if they're competing and one of them has an advantage, the one with the advantage is going to do a lot better than the one that does not have that advantage. All right. And so here are the habitat, uh, just a physical environment to which an organism has become adapted and survives in. Right, so here you see these are different organisms, different animals in their habitat. And we're using a lot of animals, but remember plants are also living things, little microscopic cells and uh, bacteria and things like that. Those are also living things, right? And they all have habitats. You know, you're, you probably never even really thought of this, but your stomach is a habitat. Your body is a habitat. We have so many bacteria, so much bacteria living in our bodies that uh, we are their habitat, right? This is where they live in our stomach, on our uh, skin. Like we have bacteria everywhere on our bodies. And so, you know, we see a lot of animals, but remember, uh, habitats, uh, all living things, um, not just animals, plants, cells, all of that, right? And so something interesting about habitats that I was reading is our homes of animals that uh, usually when an animal is closer to its home, it is more aggressive. And so like if two animals are going to fight each other, it, it's been said that the one that is closest to its home or its habitat is going to be the more aggressive one. And that kind of makes sense, right? If you think of us like humans, if someone comes into your house, like uninvited, you are going to be very aggressive, right? Especially if you have your children and things, your valuables there at your home. And so it's kind of like that with animals too. So I just wanted to throw that in there because I always found that interesting on like aggression, the closer they are to their house, the more aggressive they're going to be. But it's just a physical environment to which an organism has uh, become adapted and survives in. So if you look at that, that uh, who was that Finding Nemo, right? That orange clownfish, that those blue things right there, I think those are called sea anemone, 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 one of those. Um, and they are, they sting uh, other animals that come through there. But this fish has become adapted so that they don't sting him when uh, he's in that water, or she, um, in that water, in those uh, blue sea anemone things. Anemone, yeah. And so, you know, they've adapted to that environment. Same thing with those polar bears. They can withstand the cold. We'd probably die if we had to go up and live in that area. But polar bears are good. And the same thing with that uh, monkey. I think it's a macaque monkey, macaque. And um, yeah, it's adapted to live there in the jungles. And so the niche, this is what we're talking about, right? It's an organism's occupation or the role where it lives and the way in which organisms use conditions they exist in. So that's what I was saying, right? Like my niche is uh, teaching science here. Um, but for these animals right here, right, there's de different uh, adaptations that they have. That one that has like a really long uh, pointy beak, the very top one right here, this guy, is a, what do you call it, nect nectarivore, right? And nectarivore, if you see that right there, that its beak, it's used to suck nectar out of the flowers, right? So that's why uh, it, it's adapted that niche right there. It has evolved that beak so that it can just kind of uh, drink the nectar of the flowers. And it doesn't have to compete with this guy right here, the insectivore for insects, right? So this one's drinking the nectar. This one's uh, eating insects. And so they don't compete, right? And this guy right here is eating grain. That's its niche. This guy right here is eats seeds. Uh, this one's for fishing, netting. Uh, so it catches fish differently. It just open, it opens its mouth and they swim in there filter feeding and this looks like a flamingo and it kind of sticks its head under the water kind of like where the muck is the mud and it it filters all that and eats like the shrimp that's the interesting thing about flamingos y'all is they say they're normally like a white color but because they eat shrimp which is pink eventually the flamingo flamingos turn pink 
And so this guy, look at its beak right here, surface probing. It means it just checks the water, the surface of the water, right? For maybe little tadpoles and insects. Um, and so, you know, different, different things, right? So this one is mostly focusing on the food that they eat. That's why their beaks are shaped in this way. In bio B, you'll learn about uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin and his finches and how their beaks were shaped because of where they lived and what they ate. Uh, they're placed in the food web, right? So are they uh, food for something or are they eating uh, other living things? Right. What is their place in that food web, how it gets its food? And we just kind of went over all of these different kind of birds over here. Some get the nectar, some insects, uh, some uh, fish, a shrimp, all of those different kinds of um, not not just the food it eats, but how it gets them. Right. And a lot of these you see they're the shape of their beak is what allows them to eat the food the way they do. And so the range of the temperature, some of these guys will live in very cold areas. Some of them would die if they got in super cold areas, right? A lot of birds will migrate though. They'll go up south during the, the winter and then, sorry, they'll go, yeah, south during the winter. And then in the uh, summers, they'll go back up north, right? So birds will change, but for the most part, birds will have a niche, a niche or a niche in uh, certain temperatures. And then also when and how it reproduces. So that's one thing, right? Some of these may uh, reproduce during the day, some of them at night. And so, you know, it all depends. Uh, maybe some of them during the winter, some of them during the summer. So it all depends on what their niche is, right? What, what their, um, their role is in the environment. And so biomes, a biome is just a group of similar ecosystems with the same general abiotic factors and primary producers. Biomes may be terrestrial or aquatic. So again, this is like the desert. This is like a uh, rainforest. This right here, I keep saying tundra. I don't know if you all know what a tundra is, but basically it's a really cold area where the plants barely grow because of how cold it is, but there's still plants there and things like that. And then an aquatic biome, again, just means something underwater. Right. So, uh, yeah, biomes uh, are huge um, or bigger chunks of land that uh, has those ecosystems with the same general abiotic factors like deserts. Right. They have cactus. Well, abiotic um, would the cactus would be biotic, but abiotic would be like the temperature, how much rain it gets, like what kind of a ground is there? Is it soil? Is it sand? So those kinds of things. So here's a survey of some terrestrial biomes. So here you see like the tropical rainforest. You'll see them like down here in South America in this area um, right here where we live. It's usually like a subtropical um, area where I used to live in the Rio Grande Valley down here. You see like Florida and the, the west, the eastern part of the United States is kind of this temperate deciduous forest. Um, and so it all depends on that. That's one of the cool things about the U.S. is you have all these different biomes just within the U.S. And then you can see when you get up north, you get into the polar ice caps and the tundra is like kind of in between. And so, yeah, these are what the biomes are right here. And the tropical deserts, you'll see there's some like in California and uh, Nevada in that area. And then in like uh, the continent of Africa and even in Australia down here, you see a lot of um, uh, deserts. Right. So that, that's what a biome is. They're classified by climatic factors, which is like basically how cold and how wet and how or how dry and and hot areas are. And types of primary producers, y'all will learn about that in a little bit, but primary producers are like the the first thing that um, I don't know if you want to think about like plants, right? They kind of uh, make food just through sunlight. And so the biosphere, the biosphere is just a part of the earth where life exists, right? And again, bio, you can see right here and it kind of. Um, doesn't stand out too well against this, but you can see right here, biosphere. Uh, bio means living. And then sphere just means like a ball shaped, right? So uh, all the living things on earth extends from the deepest parts of the ocean. And it gets very deep in the ocean, y'all, like super deep. Extends, uh, and then it goes up into the highest, into the air, right? Where plant spores drift. So plant spores, y'all, are just kind of little super small seeds that will float through the air, right? That's kind of how you can think of spores. And, and uh, mushrooms and fungus also release spores. Ecologists study the biosphere to see how organisms interact with the abiotic environment, right? So how living things interact with the non-living things. And so you could think of that as how fish adapt in the, the water, right? There was this huge shortage of like, uh, what was it, lobsters or something like that? And they had to shut down the lobster industry um, because there were no lobsters. And then people were like freaking out. Well, what happened to the lobsters? Where did all the lobsters go? We used to catch tons of them and now we can't find any lobsters. And it turns out that the temperature of the water is getting too high 
And lobsters love cold water. So when the temperatures get too high, they start to die inside of that water. And then there's no more lobsters for anyone to, to fish because they're all dead. Right. So that's kind of what ecologists are studying is like, how did those lobsters, which are biotic, how did they how were they affected by the abiotic factor of the the warming up of the ocean water? Right. The Earth's atmosphere, water, soil and rock are all part of that environment. And so, yeah, again, biosphere is just all the living things on uh, the planet. And so here's another example of a question. A science class is planning a field trip to a local farm that has a large pond. Which of the following lists of the order of a biological organization from smallest to largest that the students can expect to find at the pond? Remember, you also for this one, you kind of if you don't know for a fact, just start with like the process of elimination. Right. You know, hopefully, you know, by now that, um, you know, the, the first thing should be on here. That should be on here. Should be organism. So you see these two have organism. This one does not. Um, but, you know, that that's just part of it. So whenever you do these, start with the process of elimination. And then if you uh, kind of remember which is the largest one. So for the largest one, it was biosphere, but I don't see biosphere. But the next thing was ecosystem. So let me highlight these. And I know it's not this one right here, so I'm just going to kind of scratch this out. And so population, I know it's also not this one because an organism is a first and it comes before population. All right. And so just by doing that, you kind of reduce your chances from um, what is it? So you have all of those right there. Right. And so now you have a 50 50 chance of getting the right answer. Right. So make sure that when you're taking exams and things like that, that you always use a process of elimination to uh, scratch out the ones that, you know, are not the right answer. Right. And so then, yeah, go ahead and, and figure this the rest out on your own. And so here you just kind of see that recap. Right. Remember that the individual is just the individual one. Right. Like one living thing. And then a population is a group of those living things in one area. Right. And here you see this is a moose and this is a group of, of moose, mooses, mooses, moose. Um, and then here you have the community, right? Different living things living together. And here you see a moose. It looks like a cougar or a beaver, a rabbit, an owl. And then over here in the ecosystem, you have uh, different things living together. You have bears and I don't even know, maybe another bear there. But it's also with the uh, abiotic things, right? Like uh, mountains and water and uh, dirt and things like that. And then the biome you see here, the biome are, um, you know, like things like a tundra, a desert, a rainforest, those kinds of things. And then the biosphere, again, is just all the living things on the planet Earth. 